Hi, um, thank you, Michael. So first, I would like to thank Michael and other uh, other organizers uh, for this uh, ABC seminar series for inviting uh, uh, well me and Pierre to talk on our uh, recent paper. <clears throat> so uh, as you said, this is our uh, paper, partial exchangeable networks and architectures for learning some statistics in ABC that we will. Uh, discuss uh, today. Uh, and what we do in this paper is that we do develop a deep learning method for learning summary statistics in ABC. And this is a uh, joint work with Humberto Puccini at, uh, in Gothenburg and Jess Wessels at the uh, Technical University of uh, Denmark. Uh, so, first, we'll have a quick uh, recap of uh, likelihood free inference. So uh, in uh, in uh, our setting, we observe that we have uh, an observed data set YOBS with M units. And for this uh, data, we also have a, a standard uh, Bayesian uh, model um, that should be familiar to everyone. And we also assume that the likelihood is intractable. So this means that we can't not evaluate it, evaluate it point wisely for some reason. Uh, but we assume that we can simulate data uh, from the model for any parameter setting. <clears throat> and then we will, in our uh, talk today, consider the ABC rejection sampling uh, algorithm. So this is uh, perhaps the easiest ABC algorithm that we have. So it works that we simulate the proposal from the prior. Then we generate uh, um, <clears throat> the corresponding data set, Y star. Uh, conditioned on our sample proposal. And then we simply uh, accept Y star as a draw from the uh, posterior if the summary statistics for Y star is similar to the summary statistics for our observed data set Y uh, So the function S here uh, is a function that computes the summary statistics uh, of the data. And uh, the main goal in our work is learning this S function automatically, and we will also leverage probabilistic symmetries in the data to learn this uh, function efficiently. And Pierre will later discuss more on how we how we leverage probabil the probabilistic symmetries in the data for uh, certain cases. <clears throat> so let us, let us now consider this summary statistics function. So it is a function that maps from the data with our M, M units to some set of uh, statistics that are our summary statistics. Then. And uh, well, hopefully the dimension of the summary statistics is lower than the dimensionality of the data. And the summary statistics are usually necessary due to curse of dimensionality because if we would start to compare the data sets uh, on, them, on their own we, without applying the summary statistics uh, function, we would compare high dimensional data sets and that would not be very uh, efficient in many cases. So we want our summary statistics to be low dimensional and uh, informative for the parameters that we want to infer. So that is perhaps also something that we should point out that what we are interested in is, of course, uh, inferring or learning. In the end, we are interested in inferring or learning the parameter posterior distribution. <clears throat> so handpicked summary statistics are often used. So this could be things like the mean, quantiles, correlations, if we're time series, or other statistics that we, for some reason, think are informative of the data. So here we can usually use domain knowledge of the model that we are working with to figure out which summary statistics that uh, should be used. And then there are there have been several methods uh, developed on the problem of learning and selecting summary statistics. So uh, the handbook of ABC has an entire chapter on this particular topic uh, discussing many different uh, other approaches than the one that we will uh, discuss today. <clears throat> so this is by no means a new uh, problem. So, in the case that we have hand, uh, hand summary statistics, we have our data, then we select 
some summary statistics, and then we are selecting the and pixel statistics to obtain uh, low dimensional statistics that are uh, that we will use in our ABC method. Uh, <clears throat> however, we can also have a semi automatic uh, method which is developed for an atom triangle. So, what we do here is that we have our data, then we pick a large set of uh, hand picked statistics, and then we use a uh, regression model to um, to automatically learn the low dimensional statistics, and in this case, we will learn posterior mean, and uh, we will later on discuss why we would want to learn posterior mean as the summary statistics. But the idea here is that we hand pick a large summary, large set of of uh, statistics, and then from that we develop the regression model to learn posterior mean as our summary statistic. Uh, and this uh, idea can also be uh, used with a, a feed forward network. So this is what we've done by uh, Cream. Um, so it's almost the same setting that we have our data. We uh, set up a large set of and pick statistics, and then again we have this automatic regression model to obtain a low dimensional set of statistics. But in this case, this uh, automatic regression model will be, will be a feed forward network. So ha we have a more expressive regression model than if we just use linear regression. Um, and another method that is uh, also in this uh, style, let's say, um, is by Ryan. Uh, and uh, what they do there is that they use a random forest regression uh, approach to to build their regression model based on a large set of statistics. But then, of course, the random forest uh, algorithm allows them to use many summary statistics, and the algorithm will still uh, Base the model on the most informative ones, so it doesn't. Even if they include some statistics that are not very useful to learn the low dimensional representation, that is not uh, a problem for them. Um, however, in the methods that we have discussed before, we have to select. We have to first select a large set of statistics, and then we try to learn low dimensional uh, statistics. But uh, this can also be done uh, automatically, so that is what's done in the paper by, by Jiang. So what we have is that we take our data, then we feed our data through a feed forward network, and the, this feed forward network will automatic, automatically learn low dimensional statistics. It will actually learn exterior mean, as we'll discuss later on. So here we have uh, removed the step of having to select a large set of summary statistics to base uh, our automatic mo model, uh, model from. It's sort of a fully automatic framework. And this idea is also what we use in our paper. <coughs> uh, so again, we take our data and we want to directly target the low dimensional statistics. Uh, however, we will use a partial exchangeable network that allows us to leverage the symmetries in the data when we try to learn the slow dimensional statistics. And Pierre will uh, discuss this more later on. Um, so then, of course, um, one question that we have is, why do we want to learn the posterior mean as a summary statistics? So, um, Fernando and Frankel uh, shows in their paper uh, <clears throat> that posterior mean is the best sum of statistics in terms of the quadratic loss of the parameters. So this gives us some um, gives some motivation for why we want to select the posterior mean as the summary statistic. Uh, so what they do is that they let the summary statistics function parameterize with parameters beta to be the posterior mean. And then they will learn uh, the posterior mean via simulations because, of course, the posterior mean is, um, is unknown. And then in their paper, they also uh, model the posterior mean with linear regression model 
uh, that's what we have here. So in this model, we actually have one uh, linear regression model for each uh, dimension uh, of theta. So for each theta j, we have one of these models. And then age of j is a vector of nonlinear transformations uh, of the data that is used in this linear regression uh, approach. So how we learn this posterior mean via simulations uh, works as uh, the following. First, we simulate uh, parameter data pairs from the prior predictive distribution. So this corresponds to your sampling data from the prior and generating corresponding data sets from the model. Uh, and then we fit the linear regression model uh, to the par parameter uh, data pairs uh, considering this squared error loss function. So in this optimization problem here, uh, this is j beta j uh, is the regression model uh, that we had in our last slide. And we have j uh, regression models in total. So we have one of these optimization problems for each dimension of the parameters, parameter space. And then a rather uh, important point here is that this is, this is, this is a step of learning uh, the posterior mean as the statistics is something that we do before we run ABC. So once we have fitted the regression model, uh, we run ABC as usual using this uh, S function with the estimated parameters beta j hat uh, to compute the j for some statistics. So once we have done this step, we can run either ABC reaction sampling, but we could also use a more um, advanced ABC, looking for instance, ABC and CMC, and still using this S function as the summary statistic. Uh, and now it's uh, uh, Pierre's turn to uh, tell us how we use the probabilistic symmetries in the data. Uh, all right, so uh, thanks, uh, Samuel, and uh, many thanks to the organizers for uh, making this happen. Uh, all right, so as Samuel explained, uh, we, we have like a, an optimization problem that we want to solve uh, using uh, samples from the prior predictive distribution. And the main uh, question we're going to look at now is how, how do we find a function class for this uh, S function, okay? Uh, so um, our goal is to find a principled functional space for the summary function, okay? So, but principled based on what? Um, the idea will be to leverage uh, some probably six symmetries about the model. Uh, indeed, uh, often we, we don't know, uh, well, in, uh, in the problems that interest us, we don't know the likelihood, but we may often know some symmetries of the model. Okay, so what do I mean by uh, symmetries? Uh, let's start with a very simple example. Uh, the simplest example of uh, model symmetry I'm interested about uh, is uh, exchangeability. So exchangeability uh, is a property of, um, of uh, statistical models that basically says that the order of observations or the order of units does not matter. Um, okay, so this can be written that way. Uh, so if we have a data set Y, again, Y is the entire data set. If you have a data set Y and that we reorder it uh, by a permutation sigma. So sigma is, is a permutation, so a reordering of the data. And SM is the, the, the set of all permutations of all, reorder, of all reorderings, usually called the symmetry group. So if you have a, a data set Y and, and we reorder it using sigma that way, then it, the density of the data does not change. Um, so that's called exchangeability, and that's of course the case for a lot of models. That, that's the case for all models where the order of the acquisition of the data is not, uh, is not important. In particular, that's the case of IAD models, models with IAD data, and also uh, condi conditionally IAD models. By conditionally IAD models, I mean models that are conditionally IAD given the parameters, which again is the case of a lot of Bayesian models. Uh, you first sample a global parameter from the prior, and then once you have the global parameter, then you sample everything IAD. And um, uh, so 
Definitely's uh, famous theorem says that um, uh, basically if you have exchangeable data, then uh, uh, it can be represented as some kind of conditionally ID model. Okay, I will mention the Finitis theorem a, a few times, but if you don't know anything about this, it's, uh, it's really not necessary at all to, to know about the Finitis theorem to understand what I'm going to say. Uh, so one important consequence of exchangeability is that then, since the order does not matter, the order does not matter for the posterior as well. So it means that uh, if the data are exchangeable, then the posterior is permutation invariant. Okay, so you can permutate again the order of the, of the operation. You, you want the posterior. All right, so what does, it, what the, does this have to do with uh, summary statistics? Uh, well, since the posterior is permutation invariant, and what we do, our goal at the end is to um, uh, approximate the posterior, then it makes sense that we should look for um, permutation invariant summary statistic functions. Okay, so what we're going to look for are like functions that uh, are invariant to reorder rates, invariant to permutations. So again, that can be written mathematically like this. For any permutation in the symmetry group, uh, the action of the permutation does not change the value of the function. Uh, the question is now, is it possible to design rich spaces of uh, such permutation line functions? And, um, and one way of doing this is to uh, use uh, a whole subfield of deep learning called the permutation invariant neural networks. All right, so I'm going to present this subfield very quickly. Um, so Permutation networks have been around since the 80s, um, but recently there have been like there has been like uh, some kind of renewed interest, notably with this paper called Deep Sets, um, and uh, that proposed a specific architecture for permutation invariant neural networks uh, that use two neural nets. I'm going to, to dis describe it later, um, and this has been a very popular paper, and uh, a lot of follow-up work has been done. And the nice overview just came out actually uh, in the Journal of Machine Learning Research by uh, Ben Bremredi and uh, EYT called uh, Publicistic Symmetries and Invariant Neural Networks. Uh, okay, so uh, how, does those, uh, how do those deep sets network work? So the idea is to use uh, two neural networks. Uh, oops. Uh, okay, so the idea is to use two neural networks. Um, so why i are all the, the uh, observations in, in, in our data sets? So again, I have m observations. And the idea is that I am going to have a, one inner network that will act individually on each observation. And this inner network will take as input the observations and give as output a low dimensional representation, uh, a phi of y, that lives in a space rk. So k will be a hyperparameter. So uh, again, this uh, inner network will take as input the observations and uh, produce as output the representation. Now, what we're going to do is to sum the outputs the output, uh, and to feed this sum to another network, the outer network, that will transform this uh, sum of representation into uh, the target, basically, for example, the posterior mean. Um, so again, it's fairly simple. You take all uh, observations individually. You apply the same function to all of them, phi. Then you sum all the all the outputs, and then you apply another function rho. And uh, of course, it's quite uh, easy to see that this will be permutation invariant uh, because um, uh, since uh, we apply uh, when we compute all of those, uh, we, we compute those for, for for all observations, and then we sum them. And since the sum is invariant to permutations, uh, the, the whole function will be invariant to permutations. We could replace the sum by any other invariant, uh, permutation invariant function, and that would be the, the same um, the same thing. Uh, for example, we could use, use like the maximum or the minimum. But the nice thing with the sum is that uh, Zahir et al. proved that with this specific architecture, you can approximate any permutation invariant function, given enough capacity, of course, using like powerful enough uh, networks, rho and phi. Uh, so that's why this, uh, this architecture uh, is really quite, uh, quite popular. Um, and at the end, the networks are, are relatively small because like this one uh, takes as input only uh, data points and uh, as outputs, low-dimensional stuff, 
And this one takes two dimensional stuff as input and uh, will output like parameters. Uh, like compared to, the, to a single network that would take like the entire data set as input, that's really much more parsimonious and simple. Uh, okay, so um, this idea, the idea of using such networks to uh, process data sets in a likelihood free uh, inference was actually already used by, uh, by uh, Chan et al. in a nice paper published in Uris. Uh, it was not exactly in an ABC context, but almost. Uh, all right, so this is, uh, this is very nice. Uh, there is one issue, though, which is that um, often when we have likelihood like free models, those are like very complex models, and they will they might very well not be not exchangeable. Okay, exchangeable models are usually quite simple, uh, although there are of course a lot of exceptions. And there are a lot of uh, likelihood free models that are non exchangeables for example, like any models with table structures, like safe space models or, or SDEs. So uh, the question we're going to uh, ask now is, can we find some kind of uh, weaker version of exchangeability that's suitable for those uh, more general models, like time series? And uh, actually, such weaker version of exchangeability exists uh, for the specific case of Markov chains. And uh, so for that, we borrow um, a lot of uh, a lot of the theory that that was developed by uh, Percy Diaconis and Dave Friedman in that uh, nice paper from 1980. And uh, we're going to use the, the notion of partial of partial exchangeability, sometimes called Markov exchangeability, that they introduced in this paper, building on some prior work by uh, Definiti and uh, a lot of people. Uh, all right. So how does uh, how do this uh, how do this uh, like uh, partial exchangeability work. Uh, the idea is that, uh, of course, since we're not exchangeable, we don't want to be invariant to all permutations. So we want to find some permutations uh, where it's still desire, desirable to be invariant. And those permutations we call block switch transformations. I will describe them quickly. Uh, and, uh, and those transformations will be like uh, some specific sorts of permutations that do not change the distribution of the Markov chain. Of course, if you have a Markov chain and you just permutate the, the, the elements, it, the, the distribution will change, but with those specific permutations, it, it won't change. And as argued by uh, Friedman, this is the right kind of symmetry to invoke with, uh, when, when dealing with Markov chains. All right, so how do those uh, block switch transformations work? Basically, uh, if we have a Markov chain of order D, uh, yes, D is the order of a Markov chain. I should have written that. Um, then a block switch transformation uh, will change two blocks, which will switch two blocks uh, if and only if they start and end with the same D symbols. All right, so that's a bit of a mouthful. So uh, let's look at uh, a, a, a first picture. So uh, if I have some, uh, if I have two blocks, so here. Uh, I have like um, a realization of a Markov chain of length of length M, and I'm going to look at two, two subblocks, so one red and one blue one. And what I'm going to say is that if those, again, I'm assuming that Markov chain is of, of order D, uh, if those two start and end with the same D symbols, which is this condition, then if I apply the block switch transformation with those blocks, then the, the, the blocks will be switched, okay? And if they don't start with and end with the same D symbols, then the block switch transformation won't do anything. Um, okay, so again, if you start and end with the same D symbols, uh, then uh, you are allowed to switch. Uh, so uh, just one uh, concrete example with a chain of order one. So this is like the realization of a chain of order, of order one uh, with uh, three states, like uh, 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 gray, uh, red, and blue. And uh, I'm going to apply uh, the block switch transformation, which is this one. So here, this 2, 4, 6, 8 means that I'm switching uh, this block between 2 and 4 and this block between 6 and 8. And uh, since those blocks indeed start both with red and, and both with blue, I'm allowed to switch. And so uh, that, this will be the result of T. So this is Y, and this, this is T of Y, where T is a block switch transformation. And because it's, it's a shorter one, it's, uh, it's easy to see that this won't change the distribution. Again, that's, that's exactly what we wanted to have because like, with external data, with, um, uh, if we permit it, we don't change the distribution here, it's the same, but with those blocks switch transformations. 
All right. Um, okay, so uh, now that we have like uh, defined this uh, block switch transformation, uh, of course it, it gives us a definition of what a uh, function that are blocks that are block switch invariant, which just means that uh, if you block switch the input, it won't change the value of the function. And uh, 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 what happens is that if we have a, uh, a model that's, um, that's Markovian, then the, the posterior mean will be a function that's z block switch invariant. Okay? So again, if you have a model that's Markovian, then if you take the posterior mean, if you block switch the data, it won't change, posterior mean won't change. All right. So if you want to learn the posterior mean, or actually any uh, any function of the posterior, we should want our summary function to be block switch invariant. All right. Exactly in the same way that before we wanted uh, our function to be um, uh, invariant to all permutations. Uh, in this uh, Markov case, uh, we want our summary function to be uh, block switch invariant because the actual posterior mean will be uh, block switch invariant, all right? So, so if we look in this uh, functional space, we know that in, uh, um, at uh, the functional space that both contains the right function and is uh, parsimonious enough. So now the question is, of course, can we design neural nets that are uh, block switch invariant? Um, and that's what we did in the paper. Um, so that's, that's what we call partially extrable networks, so PENs. Uh, so here is the PEN architecture. It's quite similar to the deep sets ID. We have again two networks, one inner phi and one outer rho. And the, but it's a bit different. So the uh, outer network, the inner network, sorry, phi, will take as input uh, not the observations, but the blocks. So uh, each uh, block of, of size, sorry, of size d plus one, not d. Each, each block of size d plus one will be transformed into a low-dimensional representation RK. Um, and uh, uh, and we will do that for all blocks and then sum them. Okay. Uh, all right. And then we have another network that will take this again uh, sum representation as input together with the beginning of the chain. And this, uh, so this, uh, the two differences with deep sets is that with deep sets, we, we will only um, uh, sing, single solutions and not blocks. And, and uh, we don't have to use the beginning of the chain. And uh, what's quite nice is that if we take d equals to zero, so if we have a Markov chain of order of zero, which means IID data, then this exactly reduces to deep sets. So the, this architecture is like a, a, a strict generalization of deep sets. Uh, okay, so uh, what, what we also saw is that uh, when the data space is countable, uh, then uh, any block switch invariant function uh, admits such a representation. So that's uh, uh, a generalization of one of the theorems from uh, the Zaire et al. paper, the deep sets paper. So that's, again, that means that this uh, that this sort of formatation is quite powerful and that, that, can, that can, can help us to approximate any uh, sort of uh, um, uh, block switch invariant function. Uh, all right, so just to understand why it makes sense, I'm not going to explain the proof of this, but just to understand why it makes sense to, to use this, uh, we have here all the blocks and here the beginning of the chain. And uh, that's really very, very related with the fact that uh, that's exactly the, the sufficient statistics of, uh, of a Markov chain. If you have a Markov chain, you, the sufficient statistics are, uh, are like all the, the blocks and the beginning of the chain. Uh, and that's, that's pretty much all the, all the proof. Uh, yeah, so I'm, uh, now I'm, I'm going to, to give back, back the mic to Samuel, who, again, who is going to uh, show you some experiments. Thanks. Um, yes, so uh, thank you, Pierre. Um, so yeah, uh, now we'll look at some of the uh, results that we have in our uh, paper. So uh, the first example is the JNK distribution. 
So in our uh, in our case, uh, we want to refer to parameters a, b, uh, t, and k, and c is assumed to be uh, to be known. And the setup that we have is similar to uh, well the many other papers that also analyzes the j and k distribution. And uh, importantly, since the data for the JK distribution is IID. Uh, we have a PEM zero since the data will be exchangeable. So we uh, have the D sets architecture here actually. And here we have some data simulated from the JK distribution. So we see that it's a heavy tailed uh, distribution. Uh, so um, what we look at here is that we uh, compare the estimated Wasserstein distance, and here we have mean over 100 repetitions when comparing MC, MCMC posteriors with the ABC posteriors. And the MCMC posterior is, uh, is the analytical posterior, actually. Uh, so, what we compare with, we have uh, uh, the black uh, dash line, it's when we use hand picked summary statistics. The blue line is when we use an MLP network of uh, two different two different uh, sizes. Uh, <clears throat> so this is MLP, the uh, multi-layer perceptual network. So that's just a feed-forward network without considering the exchangeability of the data. Then we have an MLP. Uh, then the red line is an MLP network with a pre-processing step, and then in the in the in the blue in the green line we have our pen zero network. So we see that uh, we obtain a smaller Wasserstein distance compared to the other methods, and that uh, means that our ABC posterior that we obtain using pen zero is uh, more similar uh, compared to the ABC posteriors that we obtain when we use uh, the other net other types of networks to compute the summary statistics. And then we also have a, a Markov model. So here we have an AR2 uh, model that follows this uh, equation, where SEB is some standard uh, Gaussian noise. Uh, so this uh, AR2 model is a Markov model of order 2 and we will therefore use a PEM2 network. And we also have some data generated from this model here. So here we will compare three methods. So we have hand-picked summary statistics. We have an uh, MLP network, so just the standard field forward network. And then we have our PEM network of order two that takes into the account partial exchange ability of the data. And then uh, the green line here uh, shows the prior. So we have a flat prior over the loud uh, parameter space. And the control plot is the true posterior that we obtain using uh, MCMC. So in our first case, we use one million trained data points. And in this case, we see that both the MLP network and the PEM network essentially computes, uh, computes similar uh, inference results. They both learn, uh, generate the posterior distribution quite, quite nicely. Uh, however, then we decrease the training data. So the training data here is how many samples from the prior predictive that are used to train the MLP and the PEM network for. So now when we reduce the training data, we see that the MLP network performs uh, much worse since the posterior is not so well captures in, captured in this ABC posterior that we have here, while the PEM network still performs quite, quite well. And then again, we reduce the data to 10,000 points. We see similar trend that the posterior that we obtain from MLP is uh, quite poor, really, while the PEM posterior is uh, reasonably well. And then in our uh, final experiment for this case, we have uh, MLP with, uh, or here we train on only 1,000 uh, 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 
uh, training data points. So this means that MLP uh, actually produces posterior that is completely uninformative in some sense, while PEN still managed to produce posterior that is quite quite good compared to the uh, to the actual posterior. <coughs> Uh, and then we have a uh, Wasserstein uh, distance plot again, where we compute the Wasserstein distance uh, of our ABC posterior compared to the true posterior. We see that the MLP uh, methods, these blue lines, they perform really poorly if we have uh, too few training data points, but if we have many training data points, they, they work fairly well. And here we also have a PEN zero network um, that assumes that the data is exchangeable, and this is not doing very well, which is not surprising since it has uh, the wrong exchangeability property built into it. <coughs> of course, the, co the question is, is, of course, if we can use this PEN architecture in cases where we don't have a Markov model. So we also uh, try that. So we have an MA2 process with observation noise. So our latent process here, process here is an MA2 process. Uh, these sets are standard Gaussian uh, terms. And then what we observe is this Y, which is our MA2 process with some uh, observation noise term that comes from this normal distribution here. Um, so this is a non-Markovian time series model. So it's, well, there, in that case, it's not partially exchangeable. Uh, so since it's not partially exchangeable, and since it's not the Markov model, it's not uh, clear which dimension of the pen network that we should, or which order of the pen network, I should say, that we should use. But we found pen 10, where we have a pen network with d equals to 10 to work the best. And here we also simulate some uh, data from this uh, MA2 model, uh, where in blue we have without error noise and then with red with noise. So maybe we can see that the red data is slightly more, uh, more noisy. <clears throat> so again, we uh, compare the estimated mass time distance where we compare the true posterior to the uh, ABC posterior. Uh, and here we see uh, that the MLP networks, just as with the case for the uh, AR2 model, the MLP networks perform quite, quite poorly uh, when we have a, a few training data points. But if we have many, they produce, they, they generate the inference that is similarly good as to the PEN network, and we see that PEN 10 works uh, quite well, uh, even when we have a few training data points. And uh, we also have a PEN 0 network that, again, is not doing uh, very well in this case. <clears throat> uh, so another question that we have is, uh, can we learn other properties of the posterior than just the posterior mean? So what we have done in this work is that we use PEN to learn the posterior mean from the prior predicted distribution. And we also see that since PEN leverage references the uh, correct symmetries of the data, uh, it actually performs better than other deep learning based methods for learning the summary statistics. However, maybe we can learn something else. Uh, so in this paper by Redmond, the base uh, flow paper that is on archive currently, they uh, utilize, utilize structures of the data, for instance, exchangeability. And then they learn uh, the global posterior distribution from the prior predictive. So here they actually uh, they utilize the structure of the data, and then they try to target the posterior distribution directly from the prior predictive without having this extra step of targeting the posterior and then run ABC. And uh, Pierre has already uh, told us about this uh, Shang paper, uh, where they utilize an 
uh, exchangeable network to learn primary steer distribution in a population genetics uh, model. So the difference here is that they try to learn steer distribution directly and not the steer mean. <clears throat> So um, some further ideas uh, could be that we can conclude that PEM is uh, advantageous and it leverages uh, synergies of the data. Uh, so then one question is if it's possible to uh, extend our PEM network to other more complex uh, symmetries. And uh, we also want to highlight that PEM can of course also be used in more advanced algorithms, for instance, ABC and CMCM. Or ABC population Monte Carlo. Uh, and I think that was uh, everything. So uh, thank you everyone for uh, listening. Yes, uh, thanks a lot for, for, for your talk. Um, uh, let's give some uh, virtual uh, applause. Um, and as always, uh, if, if you have questions, please please use the uh, uh, raise the hand icon um, in, uh, in the software environment. There was a very quick hand up, but it disappeared. Um, was that a real question? If uh, not, I, I may start with uh, with with some questions. Um, so I, I was wondering, in the in particular, in the um, in the time series examples, um, you you have mm -hmm. in these simulations of the results that you have shown, um, you have shown uh, results with MLPs. I suppose I would naturally use like a confnet for, for in, in these situations. I think as also um, people, me including, ha have done in, in prior prior work. Um, so really, like two questions. One, and this is more theoretical. Um, how close do you think is a confnet to actually a, a pen network uh, by choosing just the window of the of the convolution operator uh, correctly? And the second question is more practical: just how well does a confnet uh, perform in in your simulations? Uh, so. Uh, maybe Pierre also wants to weigh in, in on this, but if I'm not in, incorrect, I think you can actually view uh, the pair network as a type of convolution network. Okay, so what does would would the practitioner actually need to change something from the usual architecture of a, of a confnet, or would it you know would it just work kind of out of the box? Um, they would of course have to change the, I mean, the correct size of the kernel and also the correct stride length. As, yeah, but uh, this is sure the would. usual hyperparameters. So assuming that this is yes. set correctly. Um, I think the the fact that it also depends if if you remove the that, that's a question by the way. If you remove the mm -hmm. The, the fact that it, all, that it also depends on the beginning of the chain, you can probably reuse uh, some convnet code. Uh, um, but uh, the fact that you have also the beginning of the chain is a bit, uh, uh, I think, is a bit annoying. But uh, but yeah, I, I think uh, we discussed that, but we never we never actually write, wrote it down. But you you can probably write that as a as, as a shallow confnet. Uh, the, uh, the main difference is that if I is it, if this function becomes becomes deep, then I, I don't think that, that that you can do it. But uh, uh, yes, uh, if I, if I is is um, uh, is a deep network, then you probably can't uh, you probably can't write it as a confnet. Uh, and uh, you also have the fact that it takes this as input. Uh, I don't think you can do it out of the box. Okay. But indeed, it's, it's very similar because, like again, this uh, 
this file acts like like uh, like some kind of uh, sliding window, uh, mm -hmm. the same way we have with Comnets. Mm -hmm. Uh, so then this means that, like, uh, oh, no, sorry. Yeah, the main difference is that this, this, this will be like a, some kind of nonlinear sliding window while Comnets will use like linear filters. Mm. But you will have like, okay. a, a, a Comnet will, 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 will use like a, a lot of layers of linear filters and here basically we will use like a single layer of, uh, of something linear. Mm. So then empirically, what, how, how much would the ConfNet improve over the MLP in, in the, say, moving average example? I suppose that, yeah, the improvement would be considerable. Uh, there is actually a paper where they compare, where they have this idea of comparing PEN to a convolutional network. Uh, we never did that. Hmm. Uh, and they, they have a more advanced uh, time series model, but they show that they're Convolution network could outperform PEN. Oh, okay, uh, okay. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Um, any mm -hmm. other questions? Yeah. Just uh, raise your hand as I do here, um, if you have a question. Oh, nice. I, 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 th I think I have the chance to, to um, satisfy my curiosity a bit more and ask one more question. Um, this is, it has to do to the um, kind of the basics. So, uh, right, so you, you said like, well, if you're interested in the quadratic loss, we should uh, target the, the posterior mean as kind of a summary statistic. Um, and then, well, we can use that perhaps in, in ABC. And now, perhaps in particular, like related to the um, uh, later work that, that you had in your um, last slides. So, if actually I'm interested in, in other aspects than, say, the quadratic loss between, um, well, estimated and true parameter, maybe, you know, to get the quantile correct or even to actually get the the whole posterior uh, correct. Uh, is there any theory um, on what kind of um, summary statistics one should actually target? So how would the setup actually change if I'm interested in a, in a different uh, loss? So I think there are two components of this. Um, the first component is that if you um, let me see. If you change the loss function uh, in your uh, regression uh, optimization problem, essentially, then you change which properties of the posterior that you learn. Mm. Um, yes. Um, and <laughs> so so that, that is the first uh, first part. Um, and uh, how, however, learning the, the entire posterior is sort of a different problem, I think. Um, uh, I'm not sure if you can specify the other part of the question. question you can so yeah. um, that's so that's what they actually do in this paper, and by pretty much in those two papers actually. You can also yeah. uh, see this. So if if, uh, if if you go back to to the loss function, just uh, square loss in uh, theta and uh, and, um, and 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 the prediction of the of the network, uh, but uh, well, let me just go back to the function. So yeah, the loss function is just like the, the squared loss between, um, between theta and the function, right? Uh, mm -hmm. So you could you could replace this by uh, by by, a, by a, a log likelihood of theta given a, a model. So let's say you have the rather than just predicting a, a single uh, a single value for the theta, this, the output of this is uh, the mean and the covariance of a Gaussian, and uh, and and here you compute like the log likelihood of the of theta under the mean and the covariance of this Gaussian. 
so if you do that, basically the this the loss function will be something like uh, uh, the sum of the log of uh, p uh, p s of uh, of theta, and, uh, and 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 you can see exactly that as the as the KL divergence between um, uh, between the true posterior and uh, this Gaussian uh, specified mean and specified variance. So if if you output both, like let's say a mean and a covariance, you, you can do some kind of uh, Gaussian approximation of the posterior uh, of Kulbach cool labor uh, uh, Gaussian approximation of the posterior, and that's that, that's yeah. that's formalized in those uh, in the two papers that we cite in uh, in the last okay. uh, in the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Excellent. Thanks. So, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so, so you can't compute the entire posterior, but you, you can get uh, uh, you can get um, like a Gaussian approximation, or maybe a more complex. Like uh, in, in in this paper, they use a normalism. Okay. Excellent. Thanks a lot. Yeah. And the funny hey. thing is that uh, the, the KL you get there is the is the reverse KL, not the not, not the usual KL that you get from from Bayesian in France. From Bayesian in ah, France, okay. you minimize the KL between uh, Q and P, and here it's between P and P. Mm. That's just like a funny. Mm. Mm -hmm. Cool, excellent. Yeah. Um, any other uh, questions? So um, if it's not, uh, let's uh, thank our, our speakers again. And then uh, the, the next uh, episode in our uh, season two of the seminar is in two weeks time, so the 17th, and uh, the, the speaker will be uh, Flora Che. Uh, thanks again, everybody, for uh, attending today's seminar.